Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. Thank you for joining us here on RTN TV, Scotland. My name is James Jacob Prash from Moriel Ministries, and we have Word for the Weekend. Welcome to Word for the Weekend, wherever you are, whatever your country. If you're watching us on live stream, if you're watching a recording, let Jesus be glorified in all of our lives tonight as we study his word. Let's go to him in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do praise you and thank you for your goodness, for your mercy and kindness. We ask that you be glorified tonight, Lord, and that you'd speak to us by your spirit from your word, and that these things would be honoring to your name and upbuilding to your people, encouraging to your people in the time in which we live. In the name of Jesus, amen. And it being Saturday, it's, uh, of course, Motzei Shabbat. We're past the Sabbath for our Jewish friends, but we trust you had a wonderful Shabbat. Uh, Please open with me, if you will, please, first of all, this evening, to our subject, the mixture, the mixture. I'm reading from Leviticus chapter 19, the book of Leviticus chapter 19. Verse 19, you are to keep my statutes. You shall not breed together two kinds of your cattle. You shall not sow your field with two kinds of seed, nor wear a garment upon you of two kinds of material mixed together. We have these prohibitions in the Torah against mixture. Now, of course, we're under grace, not under law, and these things are fulfilled in Yeshua in some way, and the only things we're obligated to observe mandatorily from the Torah are things that are reiterated in the New Covenant. Nonetheless, the Torah is our pedion, our teacher, to point us to Christ. And we see truths contained in this passage that are indeed reiterated in various forms in the New Testament. Do not breed together two kinds of cattle. You shall not sow your field with two kinds of seed, nor wear a garment upon you of two kinds of mixed materials together. God has a problem with mixture. God has a problem with mixture. He did not want his people, Israel, to have a mixture, either zoologically, agriculturally, or in terms of their haberdashery, as it were. Turn with me, please, to the book of Revelation, chapter 3, a very well-known passage of Scripture, and the message to the church of Laodicea. Revelation chapter 3, <clears throat> verse 15. I know your deeds, that you were neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Different people have interpreted this different ways. Some say that hot water is good, Cold water is good, but lukewarm water is repulsive to the taste. Others say that the Lord wants people who are on fire, not cold-hearted, but hot. Uh, it's better off just to say you're cold and your heart needs to be warmed than to be lukewarm and religious and have a religious pretense about the nature of your faith and your walk with the Lord. Now, his warning here and his words here, his prediction here is very strong. I will spit you out of my mouth. He rejects those in Laodicea who are like this. He does not like the lukewarm. I have been to Laodicea a number of times in Turkey, well excavated now. And if you're not familiar, the Roman aqueduct that comes down from the hot springs in a place called Pamukkala, Pamukkala, which is today something of a resort, a hot springs resort, with these white marble-type rocks and cascades. That's the source, 
and the water goes down a mountain through a Roman viaduct that still exists into Laodicea below. And in Laodicea, there are multiple springs. There are hot springs, there are cold springs, but there are springs with the hot water and the cold water mixed together, making lukewarm water. An incredible place to visit. You've got actual fountains and, and, and ancient kind of faucets with these different kinds of water. And these waters were seen to have medicinal properties and some were used for treating eye injuries and so forth or diseases of the eye. They were seen as having medicinal benefit. Uh, it's a fantastically interesting place to visit Laodicea today. Nonetheless, most of us can't go there, but it's good to understand. There's hot from Pamukkala, there's cold, which is the hot that's turned cold, or other springs that are just out of the earth and cold, and then there's the waters that mix, making the loop warm. And you can actually see these things to this very day. The Lord has left us an archaeological record of what he was talking about. Well, again, he has a problem with this mixture, even in the New Testament. Even in the New Testament, the Lord has a mixture. Well, let's begin looking at the wool and the flax. Turn with me, please, to Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 11. Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 11, please. You shall not wear a material mixed of wool and linen together, of wool and linen together. You shall not do it. It was outlawed and forbidden. How do we understand this? What is God's problem with this mixture of fabric, of clothing? What is his problem with the mixture of wool and the mixture of linen made from flax? Well, wool, of course, is God made. It comes directly from sheep. We think of sheep as a source of meat. We think of a sheep as a source of dairy products. We think of a sheep as a source of lanolin. We think of sheep as a source of wool. Wool. Okay. And sheep wool of the Middle East is a wool that lends itself well to dyeing, to being dyed various colors. Uh, white, but it can be dyed into various colors. But then you have linen. Linen. Linen is also white, generally not dyed, can be, but linen is something we normally think of as white. It is purely man made. It is harvested stalks that is man made. So we have something that is directly made by God, and we have something that is made by man out of materials created by God. God has this major problem with the mixture of wool and with flax. Turn with me, please, to the 61st chapter of the prophet Isaiah, of the Hebrew prophet Isaiah. We read about the sevenfold spirit of God that Jesus applies to himself, and the New Testament quotes the Septuagint version of it. Now, I believe the Septuagint version of this chapter is more accurate to what the original was than the Masoretic text. I believe that the Septuagint, the reason the New Testament almost always, certainly at least 80% of the time, follows the Septuagint, is because the Septuagint was copied from earlier Hebrew manuscripts than the Masoretic. King James only people would want to hang me for saying that. Nonetheless, I believe that's where the evidence takes us, and there's a reason the New Testament normally follows 
the Septuagint. But let us look to what it says. We are told in verse 10 of Isaiah 61, I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exalt in my God. Now, when you look at the Greek words of the Septuagint, this is very similar to the response of Mary in the Magnificat in Luke's Gospel to the angel Gabriel. Of my soul will exalt in God, she says, God, my Savior. Okay, she's told by Gabriel that her baby would be the Messiah and would save his people from their sins. And she says, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Contrary to the false beliefs of Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, etc., High Anglicanism, Mary confesses that she needs to be saved from sin. All have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God, even the most perfect woman who ever lived. She was not immaculately conceived, according to what she said and according to what Scripture said. She says this, perhaps paraphrasing or quoting, or, or perhaps... Um, stating in the Magnificat what she did with this passage in mind. I'll rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exult in God my Savior. Now look what it says. He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He's wrapped me with a robe of righteousness. Something we read in the Hebrew text. Ki il bishani big day yesha ma'il tzedaka yatani. He has clothed me with the garments of salvation. My ilstaka, with the with the coat, a robe or coat of righteousness, as a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. Again, the Song of Solomon has common textual features with this verse. Okay, in the, the marriage of Shlomo Hamelik and uh, Shulamit which, of course, is figurative of Christ's relationship with the church, in my view, etc. Again, I only mention that because it's a feature of the text. It's not our subject tonight. But let's look. These garments of salvation. Why does God have a problem with mixing linen and wool? Something God made and something man made. Wool comes from the hide fur of sheep. It's God made. The Paschal lamb dies, and we get a robe of righteousness from the death of the lamb. His blood, of course, deals with the sin, and the sinner, the blood of the lamb, is sprinkled, we all know this, but also we have this covering that comes as a result. This covering that comes as a result. Flax is different. People make it. The garments of salvation cannot be made by man. The garments of salvation cannot be made by man. When man tries or attempts to put on his own righteousness, it is like Adam and Eve making the clothing, as it were, the covering from the fig leaves. It's people trying to cover the nakedness, that is their own sin, with their own works or their own efforts, something that may, they made. This is religiosity. This is a false way of salvation. It is only what God does that can save, not what we do. Whatever we do is in response to what God does. Yes, our works must be there. Faith without works is dead. But it is the faith in what God has done that gives salvation. Now, if we have a real faith, we will act on it. Faith without works is dead but we are trusting in the completed work of the Lord from the aspect, obviously, of the death of the sheep that gives the robe of righteousness. 
Now, sheep could be shorn, not necessarily killed. However, in Isaiah 53, we see the Lamb of God is bought to be killed, yet he's like a sheep before his shearers. He's there for his death, but he's there as a sheep as or as a lamb to give his wool. Well, here becomes the question. In the high priest garments, the ironic high priest garments, God decrees a mixture of linen and wool. Why does God decree that the high priest shall wear something that God outlaws? That is a mixture of linen and wool. God says don't do it. God says it's a sin. The garments of salvation cannot come from what man produces. Why does the high priest have a tunic of linen, that is from flax, but have the dyed vestments of wool? Why? Well, the answer, of course, is in the epistle to the Hebrews. The Aaronic high priest, the Levitical high priest, is a shadow a type of Christ as our high priest. Christ, of course, is from the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek, he is not Levitical. However, the Levitical high priest is a type or shadow of Christ, a picture of Jesus. What he does prefigures what Christ was going to do. Why could this priest then wear linen, and wool simultaneously when no one else could. Why was this an exception? Anything spotted by the flesh is defiled. Man is completely fallen. We have no righteousness of our own capable of giving salvation. Anything righteous in us is contaminated by our human persona, by the fallen nature anything. Now let's speak about Isaiah a little bit. If you don't know this, some of our listeners and viewers do know it, but we always have new people joining us, so I will go back and explain. All of our righteous deeds are as filthy rags before the Lord. All of our righteous deeds are as filthy rags before the Lord. Of course, in the ancient world, we're speaking well in advance of female hygiene products. But it's talking of a bloodied menstrual cloth, a bloodied menstrual cloth. Our ideas of, of, uh, of the bloodied cloth, under the Levitical law, under the Levitical legislation, if a female was experiencing menstrual blood, and even if there was menstrual blood post-menstrually, she'd have to undergo a ritual kind of baptism ritual uh, called a mikvah, and Orthodox Jewish women will still do it. This idea of blood contaminates. The life is, of course, in the blood, but man's blood is bad because of sin. Uh, now, there's more to it than this. However, if you know anything about reproductive medicine, these fertility infertility clinics um, because of feminism and things like this, a lot of women are pushed into career ambitions. Not that that's wrong in itself, but they delay having babies until they're older, feeling pressured by society to go into high demand uh, professions. I've known, I know Christian women in, in high demand fields like the corporate law, the corporate world, law and medicine that have sacrificed their maternal ambitions for the sake of career and regret it. I know other women who've given up professional careers in those very fields, law, medicine, whatever, in order to have babies and be full-time mothers and then resume their careers later. Okay. So you have this whole booming industry of reproductive endocrinology, of reproductive endocrinology, that is in fertility clinics. 
The last thing a couple wanting to conceive a child and that's having problems, remember every month there's a decreased amount of ovum. When unlike unlike male spermatozoa, which is regenerated even geriatrically, in a female, you stop producing the ovum. A female is born with the germ cells of the amount of ovum she's ever going to have. When a little baby girl is born, all of her capacity to be a mother is there. She's not going to produce new ovum. And once menstruation begins, she loses a certain amount of ovum every month. And it goes down, down, down with age. If somebody already has a baby, they seem to be able to get pregnant the second time into the 30s and into their mid and late 30s. But if they haven't had a baby by that age, it becomes more difficult to conceive. And if they do conceive after the age of, say, 35 or so, there's a higher risk of miscarriage or of congenital birth defects. This is the world that it's become. Uh, in third world societies and in certain other societies, particularly religious ones like Hasidic Jews or or Mennonite people, particularly the Amish, Pennsylvania, Dutch people, whatever you think of them in terms of their belief systems, they do tend to emphasize marriage and having children at a young age, and they have a high birth rate. Okay, so we have these people. But other people, infertility has become a major problem in the developed world. So you have these infertility clinics all over the place. Uh, it's odd and strange but also a, an indictment of society that at the same time you have couples struggling to, to have children, struggling to become impregnated. You have an abortion industry that is massively slaughtering babies at the same time without any clinical reason. This is one of the paradoxes of, of a fallen world and the fallen world in which we live people are doing everything the, the, the adoption lists are so long you can't get a baby and now they, they of course they it's been legislated in america and britain thanks to tony blair that homosexuals have co-equal right of adoption as heterosexual couples you it's very difficult to adopt a baby um but it's easy to abort one uh it's very difficult to become impregnated beyond a certain age. The best infertility clinics with the best reproductive endocrinology, the best have about a 34% success rate, a 34% success rate with in vitro fertilization and so forth. Now, why do I go into all this? The last thing, the last thing a married couple trying to have a baby wants to see the last thing they want to see is a menstrual period if they are undergoing this treatment with with the progesterone injections and with the ivf and the rest of it the last thing they want is a menstrual period such couples realize that every menstrual period is a aborted a naturally aborted conception it is a failed pregnancy a failed pregnancy and it can be very discouraging for these couples going through this therapy particularly obviously the wife but it's very very difficult okay every menstrual period represents a failed pregnancy now if you're a person who has children and so forth, well, it doesn't really concern you, but if you're one of those couples struggling, it certainly does concern you. These are the statistical and clinical scientific realities. So we have this. The last thing they want to see is a menstrual period. Again, we're speaking of the ancient world before feminine hygiene products, tampons, all this didn't exist. Obviously, it was cloths. However, under Levitical law, if a Hebrew woman, again, was the, was, if menstrual blood was in any way present, she would be considered ritually defiled, ritually unclean, 
ritually unclean. Uh, we think of the story where the woman who had what most people, who most medical professionals who've looked at the text with a medical eye, the woman who had an issue of blood 12 years, Christian gynecologists and, th and things like this suspect she may have suffered from chronic endometriosis. That's what m most of the Christian medical opinion who've looked at the text speculates, who've looked at it from a medical perspective, endometriosis, very painful. And it says she suffered the pain of many physicians. Now, in those days, there were no coagulating drugs. There was no vascular surgery. There was no cauterization. They, <laughs> they use hot iron in an attempt to seal the blood vessels internal application of hot iron it's 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 unbelievable such, such torture is unfathomable when it said she suffered the pain of many physicians it, it was torture this poor woman not only that but her medical condition and the clinical efforts to cure or manage it left her socially ostracized she was ritually unclean if she touched anybody they would be unclean ritually for temple worship and sacrifices and so forth. She was an albatross. She was a social outcast because of her condition. She touches the hem of Jesus' garment. Now, the hem of a Jew's garment obviously would have been the teeth seat. 613 um, parcels, uh for each commandment of the Torah of the Pentateuch, and Jesus senses the healing power going out of him, healing this woman, and he says, who touched me? Okay. Now understand what was happening there in figure. By touching Jesus, she made Jesus ritually unclean. He bore our diseases. Now, I'm not speaking about healing always be, being in the atonement, that it's always realized, ultimately, healing is in the atonement, that the resurrection or the rapture. In the meantime, we may be healed or we may not be, but ultimately, healing is in the atonement at the resurrection. He bore our iniquities, but he also bore our diseases. He took her disease on himself. He was going to bleed, obviously not menstrually, but from the Roman flogging. He was going to bleed, or, or from the crucifixion, he was going to bleed in her place. He took her disease. He became defiled so that she could be cleansed. This process of cleansing was known as tahor, tahor, and I'll explain more about tahor from the Hebrew shortly, okay? So, the menstrual rag was a something defiling. You couldn't, <laughs> you wouldn't want to handle it. Certainly, it was something to be burned or or removed from civilization. It was a defiling thing. All of our righteousness is as a polluted garment. All of our righteousness is as a soiled, blood soiled menstrual cloth. Okay. So you picture this. That's how God sees our righteousness. What that soiled, blood soiled cloth meant was a failed birth. When we attempt to be saved through our own righteousness, trusting in our works or our rituals or abstract beliefs or philosophies of man, when we trust in our own righteousness in any way for salvation, it is a failed second birth. Okay. The soiled menstrual cloth represents failed birth. It's just a bloody mess. Okay. Our righteousness is the same thing. It, in God's eyes, it's just a mess. Biologically, the soiled menstrual cloth is a failed birth. That's what it represents. Spiritually, our own righteousness and trying to be saved by them is the same thing. It's a failed second birth. Okay. 
God was very peculiar about these garments. Now, let's continue. So the high priest alone, a figure of Christ, according to Hebrews, only he could wear a combination of linen and wool. Only he. Why? Because Jesus was sinless. What he was naturally, humanly, he was the last Adam. His body was, he, he pre-existed, but his body was created by God. And like the first Adam, it had no sin. But unlike the first Adam, he never sinned. He never fell into it. Therefore, the flesh of Jesus was pure. It was not defiled. It was not defiling. He had no sin. He who had no sin became sin in that he took ours. But he had no sin. It was no problem for him to wear linen. Something he did, it's something he did on the cross. Okay, it's something that he did, but also that his father did through him. It was a combination of what he did and what the father did. Only the Messiah, as God made man, who was sinless, could have linen and wool. His works were not defiling. They were not like a soiled menstrual cloth. They were not unclean garments. They were spotless garments because he had no sin. Now, in figure, this partially also relates to him having a seamless garment why he had a quote-unquote rich man's robe. Uh, you know, we've all heard the word faith money con artists, preachers so-called, talking about Jesus wore designer suits and all this kind of stuff. But <laughs> it does in figure relate to this. The fact that he had the rich man's garment does in fact relate to this subject we're talking about, but I'm not going to elaborate upon it now. Just remember, only Jesus could wear wool, and linen. And of course the high priest did because he was a picture of the Messiah, picture of Jesus, who would teach about Jesus. That was the only exception. God would not allow this mixture. He just wouldn't allow it. Well, what are the mixtures that God didn't like? Again, we see this here in the mixture of uh, zygotes in animals, the mixture of seeds, it, it, not only in uh, zoologically, but in agriculture and plants and planting a field, and also in fabric, fabric, fabric used for making garments, for haberdashery. Okay, now, I hope I'm making this stuff a bit clear. The Hebrew word for pure is tahor, tahor. We have a bit of a problem in Bible translations because Hebrew, biblical Hebrew, now modern Hebrew, you have a word naki. In biblical Hebrew, it can be a little more difficult. You have that root of naki in biblical Hebrew, but the main biblical word is tahor or tahir. Tahor or Tahir, where it says, Create in me a clean heart, O Lord. Um, penitential Psalm 51. No, it is Lev Tahor Brali Elohim. Not a clean heart, but a pure heart. What does this mean? What does this mean? It means unalloyed. Unalloyed. There is no mixture in it. It's not like a sweater that's 30% cotton and 70% polyester or whatever. It's non-alloyed. It's not like an alloyed metal. It is non-alloyed. It is totally pure. It's referring to something that goes beyond clean. It goes beyond clean. Now, in Greek, it's a little different. You have a word in Greek also for clean, katheia, where you get the word catharsis, 
Um, but also you have the word tahor is usually translated as meaning hagna, hagna. Look with me, please, to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. Let no one look down on your youthfulness, Paul tells Timothy, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, hagna. That is, without any mixture, without any mixture, show yourself an example of those who believe. Look at Philippians, please, chapter 4, verse 8. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. We read the following. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is hagna, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, if anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. The idea is not clean. The idea is pure, unalloyed, not mixed. God does not like the mixture. Well, let's continue looking at this. Turn with me, please, to the Epistle to the Galatians, chapter 3, verse 10. Galatians, chapter 3, please. Verse 10, what does Paul tell the Galatians? He begins, For as many as are of the works of the law, that is the Torah, are under a curse, for it's written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law, that is the Torah, the Pentateuch, would have been a scroll to perform them. Now that no one is justified by the Torah before God is evident, for the righteous man shall live by faith. However, the law, the Torah, is not of faith. On the contrary, he who practices them shall live by them. But now look at verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the Torah, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. John Bunyan explained this in a very interesting way in the Pilgrim's Progress when he spoke about wrestling with old Moses a physical athletic wrestling with one of the characters in the book called Old Moses. <clears throat> trying to be justified by the law represents trying to be justified by rule keeping. Now understand the law. The law, the Torah itself is perfect. It shows the perfect righteous standard of God. But the purpose of the law is to show we cannot meet it. The purpose of the law was to demonstrate through the example of Israel and the Jews the fallen state, the fallen nature of man after Adam and Eve, that we are fallen. That's it. We could never keep the Torah. Of the 613 commandments of the law, the Levitical sacrificial system constitutes the largest single section, virtually. Actually, technically, it could be seen as larger than the juridical, even. Um, in other words, the Pentateuch, 
the Torah, the law of Moses, had an elaborate sacrificial system, the Levitical sacrifices, prefiguring the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, Passover lamb, the Yom Kippur goats, and so forth, the uh, goat that's for the Lord on Yom Kippur, and things like this. Um, okay. They were there to atone for the fact that, that the Hebrews couldn't keep the rest of it. Okay. They couldn't keep the rest of it. Now, the Israelites had it codified. But everybody can know there was one true God. Everybody can know, you know, the essence of what is taught in the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. The law is demonstrated through Israel, but it speaks not just of Israel's condition, it speaks of the fallen human condition at large. The law, the law, the law, no matter what you do, you break the law, you can't keep the law, it's perfect. And we are not perfect, we can't keep it. Well, what are we gonna do? We're always breaking it. Well, God made a provision, a temporary sacrificial system until the Messiah comes and fulfills the law on our behalf. We have what Paul calls two laws in 1 Corinthians 9. The law, which is the law of Moses, the Deuteronomical legislation, as theologians call it, and we have the law of Christ, as Paul calls it. God hates the mixture. He hates a mixture of law and grace. When you begin relying on law for salvation, you are downplaying, understating, even undermining the redemption bought in Christ, who redeemed us from this curse. The law shows us we're fallen, that we're cursed, that we desperately need a Messiah. If you keep living under the law, after the Messiah comes and redeems you from it, and puts you under a different law, the law of grace, God hates that. Now, we're not talking here about Jewish believers and their families for reasons of personal devotion, for devotional reasons, or of cultural reasons, or of testimonial re reasons, continuing to keep Jewish observances voluntarily, like observing a Saturday Sabbath, or keeping the Hebrew festivals in a Christocentric way, showing that Jesus is the Paschal Lamb when they do the Seder, and so forth. We're not talking about that. Paul does not condemn that. Paul says he made such observances himself in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Okay, we're not talking about voluntary observances by Jews particularly, and people married to Jews for reasons of devotion, culture, and testimony to the community. We're not talking about that or against that. We're talking about two things, nomianism and legalism. Nomianism and legalism. Legalism says you can be saved by the law. Well, you could be saved by the law if you could keep it perfectly, but you can't. The only one who kept it perfectly was the Messiah. Only he could wear the garment of wool and linen. You can't keep it perfectly. It's impossible. Okay. Yeah, the law can save you if you can keep it perfectly, but the only one who's ever kept it perfectly is Jesus. Okay. Forget about it. This is a hard legalism. A hard legalism means you can be saved by works, by rule keeping. Now today, I am sorry to say there are heretical Christians, maybe well-meaning, who are so inundated by a love for Israel and the Jews that may be sincere and, and, and well-motivated, 
They're so motivated by a love for the Jews that may be sincere, God-given, but they have fallen into the terrible heresy of dual covenant theology, the belief that Jews can be saved through the law and they have their own way of salvation. We should not give Jewish people the gospel. There are people who teach and believe that. And they say they're born again. Now, I'm not saying all so-called Christian Zionists believe that, but there are those who do. This is a terrible thing. It is a terrible thing. This is hard legalism. You can be saved by keeping the law or by rule keeping. The other, the other is nomianism. Nomianism is different. It is a soft legalism. Nomianism involves a kind of synergism, synergism, where, yes, we're saved by the blood of Jesus, by the sacrifice of the Messiah, we're saved by that, and by keeping the law. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. The garments of salvation cannot be a mixture of wool and linen. <laughs> Our works are a result of having been saved. They are never a means to get saved. It is not synergism. It is not being saved by the law, and it's not being saved by a combination of law and works. Roman Catholicism essentially teaches that. No, no, no. The works we do are a result of our faith in what Christ has done in his works. He can wear the wool and the flax. Our high priest, but him alone. God hates this mixture. Now we have seen the havoc wrecked by people who get into this mixture. The forebearers of the Amish people that you see in like Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and in Iowa, and places like this who don't use electricity and all that kind of stuff, they're nice people and they make some interesting products and they have healthy food and they make nice jam preserves, and there's things about them that are interesting. But when you look at their beliefs, there's a lot of superstition, a lot of superstition, and a lot of nomianism. It combines what Christ did with works, with rule keeping. And most of these people are not saved. Their ancestors were saved. Their forebearers were Mennonites who were saved. But these people, they have gone into this stoic religiosity based on nomianism, based on this combination of what Christ did and what we did. They're wearing two kinds of garments. They are wearing linen and wool at the same time, if you understand the analogy and the fulfillment of the typology. It's just wrong. Another example, the Seventh-day Adventists. Remember, every one of those followers of David Kordish and the Branch Davidian sect in, in, in um, Waco, Texas, every one had been a Seventh-day Adventist. Every one had been that. I often recall the story when I coincidentally at five o'clock in the morning at Los Angeles airport, I ran into little Richard, <laughs> the rock and roll singer, and I talked to him a bit, very shortly, very brief. I, don't, I only met him the one time, I was very briefly in the airport, just happened to run into him. And he had a book that he gave me. It was, it was, his, his assistant was carrying them. And it was a book, a little a booklet. And I read the first half of the book. And it was all correct. It was all correct. It was all the gospel. But the second half was all this Seventh-day Adventist dietary and Sabbatarian legalism. We've had people who... Um, uh, friends of our ministry in Southern California around Loma Linda, where the university is, who've been saved out of Seventh-day Adventism. 
um, a lot of people from the medical profession who were at their university, uh, some medical scientists and physicians who've come out of out of it, but they grew up in it. And you've got this nomianism, this combination of law and grace, mixed garments, what man does, what God does. And as I've warned before, much, much of the modern messianic movement, not all of it, some of it is not a problem, but much of it is permeated, some of it even saturated, by law keeping in an obligatory way not for devotion not for culture not for testimony but putting people back under the law neo-galatianism there is a lot of neo-galatianism in the modern messianic movement particularly one faction who calls itself torah observant now i don't care eating kosher and someone keeping Saturday as the Sabbath and observing the Hebrew feasts, as long as you're honoring Jesus as the fulfillment of it. I have no problem with those things. My family are Israeli Jews. We've always done those things, always, but not in a legalistic way. And it's not a way to, to get saved or to say it's necessary for salvation. Only Christ can wear the wool and flax. Now, something else I only mentioned in passing. Remember the woman with the endometriosis, apparently, who grabs the hem of his garments. She would have grabbed most likely the titsi, the tassels. I'm not saying they're right for doing it, but Orthodox Jews today, they wear a talit, a talit, or talis in Yiddish, and the tassels representing the Torah or on the fringe. Okay. The talit itself is made from linen, dyed fabric. But the tassels are made from wool. Somehow they understand that God gave the Torah, <laughs> people gave the rest. I'm not saying they're right for doing it, but I'm saying it's interesting to note that they make a distinction between the linen and the tassels. Even though God said not to make a garment like that, they somehow have the sense that the Torah is God-given. Nonetheless, let us continue looking at this concept of the mixture. He hates a mixture of law and grace, of neo-Galatianism. So much of what you see going on in a certain access of the modern messianic movement, certain things you see going on in certain religious subcultures that become cultic, like the Hutterites or the Amish, and certainly the Seventh-day Adventists, certainly. These are things God hates. They're mixing law and grace. They're mixing what man does and what God does as a way of salvation. It's not a way of salvation. It's not even a way of sanctification. On a personal basis, God may lead someone to do it devotionally, and that's between them and the Lord. But you can't say that these things are necessary to achieve sanctification, to become holy, because Colossians says, they don't. They don't. They have the appearance of religion, but are useless in overcoming the flesh. Understand what we're trying to say here. Well, let's continue. Leviticus chapter 2, verse 1. Before we look at the New Testament, let's look at Leviticus 2, 1. Now anyone who presents a grain offering as an offering to the Lord, his offering shall be a fine flour. He shall pour oil on it, and he shall put incense on it. Okay. He shall then bring it to Aaron's sons, 
the priests, and they shall take a handful of its fine flour, of its oil and frankincense, and the priest shall offer up the smoke as its memorial portion on the altar as a soothing aroma by fire to the Lord. We know that the oil has to do with Shemin, the anointing of the Spirit, and we know that incense from Revelation chapter 8 and from the book of Ezekiel is the prayer of the saints. The prayer of the saints. The grain offering is a type of the sacrifice of Christ that is non-animalistic. We have a teaching on the grain offering, how it teaches about Jesus, it's available on moriel.org. But just notice that. Now, with this in view, let's continue. 11. In this chapter, we are told, Leviticus chapter 2, that in the grain there can be no leaven. In the grain, God would not allow any leaven to be present. Oil, yes, incense, yes, but we're told there can be absolutely no leaven mixed in with it. No leaven at all. Verse 5, your offering is grain offering made on a fire. It shall be a fine flour, unleavened and mixed only with oil, but not mixed with leaven. A little leaven leavens the entire lump of dough. Now, we've talked about this kind of thing a number of times. We've spoken about it quite a number of times. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, put away the leaven, the leaven of malice and unrighteousness. Leaven is a figure of sin, particularly of the sin of pride. It puffs up. And it is related inextricably to false doctrine. When people are into false doctrine, false doctrine always involves spiritual pride. False teachers, teachers who teach false doctrine, seriously false doctrine now, are people who are given to spiritual pride, okay? Uh, it puffs up. It puffs up. Um, sometimes to the point of Gnosticism. They know things other people don't and things of this nature. You've got to get on board with me and I'll explain it to you. Now, there is a biblical gift of teaching, but God is our teacher. <laughs> it's the name of our ministry, Mordiel. God is our teacher. When you hear something from Jacob Prash, you pray and ask the Lord to confirm, is it right? Is it true? If God is using this teaching or others like it to bless you or to enlighten you and open you to the scriptures, keep us in prayer. Praise God for that. But <laughs> I'm nothing but a vehicle and an unworthy one at that. God is our teacher. You have to test and weigh everything. Be careful. When you see these guys, God has shown me and the Lord has revealed to me. Be careful. Be careful. Spiritual pride and false doctrine go hand in hand. One is the symptom of the other. One is symptomatic of the other. Now, a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough. It doesn't take much. Remember, Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. That is their false doctrine. And what do you see with them? They were driven by spiritual pride. But they had their false doctrine. They had the oral law, the Torah be'al pay. False. But they were proud. Matthew 23 describes their behavior. In Matthew 23, Jesus describes their behavior. Well, look with me, please, to Second Peter chapter 2. A familiar passage to those who follow our ministry. But false prophets arose as among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will parasozusen, secretly introduce destructive heresies among the people. The way of truth will be maligned. 
secretly introduce it. The word parasogzus and para is next to. They put truth next to error. They put truth next to error. They use truth to camouflage the error. It's like putting arsenic into a glass of orange juice. You can kill someone with it, but the orange juice disguises the poison. It doesn't take a lot of arsenic to murder somebody. But if you put it in grapefruit juice or orange juice, it could taste even refreshing. But it's death. Well, leaven, a little leaven leavens the entire lump of dough. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Now, we're not talking about peripheral or secondary doctrinal issues. We're talking about major heresies. Major heresies. I know... Uh, well, just last week we talked about a, a case responding to people in Scotland who were defending people who had another gospel. We can prove with the videos that they were teaching a false way of salvation. That you know, concerning that the blood of, of Christ will not always be efficacious, and that sin can be forgiven by kneeling down and telling it to a man, and apart from the priesthood of all believers. He is a member of a clergy class, and this clergy class that he's into empowers him to forgive your sin if you kneel down and tell them to him. Now, this is completely terrible. This is, Roman Catholicism is this and so forth. But this is completely terrible. Uh, <laughs> no, whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven them. Whose sins you shall retain, they are retained. Jesus did not give that power to a priestly class. He gave it to all of us to pronounce the unsaved forgiven if they repent and believe in Jesus. And dealing with sin in the fellowship, we can be gracious to each other, but there's no clergy class that has a power that you or I don't have. There is simply no basis for that kind of teaching in Scripture. Um, that's like going back under the law, going back to a Levitical priesthood. The Catholics call it holy orders, and catechetical Lutherans retain it. And this person they were talking about, Rosebro in the States, is a catechetical Lutheran. Kneel down and, and tell him. Well, this is another gospel. This is leaven, leaven. And so you know, they made videos of all these rather naive and undiscerning women, I must say, and they may have been set up. The whole thing was scripted. It was silly. It was obviously scripted and contrived. And they may not have known it, but it was it was staged and scripted. And all the good, and I didn't see anything bad, and I didn't see. Parasozusid. These people lent credence to at least two figures, two different times, with false Gospels. A little leaven, and men, the men laws did that in Scotland. It doesn't matter what else they did, it's a little leaven. Parasogzusin, you put true things next to the lie. But it's deadly. It causes the Word of God to be maligned. And people get caught up with this. Many will follow their sensuality. You just see a lot of this emotional women thinking with their emotions. Because of them, the way of truth will be maligned. And this goes on. Well, I don't want to go into it now. We've talked about it enough. But this is what happens. The way of truth becomes maligned. It doesn't take a lot. God hates the mixture. If it's 90% true and 10% leaven, the leaven is going to win. It's going to permeate the entire loaf, the entire cake. A little leaven leavens the entire lump, a few drops of arsenic. It could be 90% true. Now, I'm not talking about who's premillennial and who isn't. That's an important issue. But people who are not premillennial are not heretics. They're just misguided on that point. Okay. We're not talking about things like that. 
we're talking about things like the gospel. <laughs> the way of truth becomes maligned. Well, let's move on and look at this further. God hates this kind of image. He hates it. Oh, it's mostly good, and I was so blessed, and it was the Lord was in it. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. You, you know, uh, online promoting people with false gospels. <laughs> all, all the things that are true are only camouflage. According to Peter. Sin's not forgiven by confessing it to a man. The blood of animals can never take away sin. No, a little leaven leavens the entire lump. God hates the mixture. In Leviticus chapter 2, there was no leaven in the grain. But let's move on. 14. be bound together with unbelievers for what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness or what fellowship has light with darkness what partnership what fellowship do not be bound with unbelievers now obviously this is talking about marriage first and foremostly if you are already married to an unsaved person and then you become a Christian yourself and you have an unsaved husband or you have an unsaved wife, after your own relationship with the Lord and the salvation of your children, the most important thing in your life is the salvation of that unbelieving husband or unbelieving wife. You cannot leave them unless they leave you and go off with someone. You're still bound to them. Okay. But if you're a Christian, if you're a saved Christian, to marry an unsaved person, as I've said before, it's like standing in a puddle and putting your finger into an electrical socket. Christian marriages are under attack as never before. To get into marriage, not only a legal and social contract, a physical bonding, an emotional cementing together with spiritual aspects to it, with a non-believer. You're supposedly heading for heaven, they are heading for hell, and you're going to become bound to them? Avoid marriage with non-believers. Christian marriages struggle. Even the best ones are attacked. And people in ministry, they're often attacked through their families, their marriages. You can only build a marriage on Christ. If a husband and wife both truly believe in Christ, that marriage will not fail because of Christ. But when you have an unbelieving partner, good luck, you may need it. In fact, you'll certainly need it. I have never known a Christian, male or female, who's married to an unsaved person who is happily married. He may be a nice guy, she may be a great cook or whatever it is, you know. I have never in my life met a saved Christian with an unsaved partner who's happily married. How can you be? That is obvious. Right now, please keep me in prayer. I am trying to get, get rid of my secular business. It's a small business, but it has been lucrative, and the Lord has blessed it at times, and it helped fund the ministry and so forth, and, and enabled me to get my children privately educated and through university and law school and things like this without going into debt. I thank God for it. He has used it. And uh, 
it helped fund Moriel to get going and things like this. And it doesn't take a lot of time. It's just a sideline, but it's there. But it's, I believe, time for me just to get rid of it. I want to be full-time in the ministry. I'm, I am full-time in the ministry, but I have a part-time thing in addition. I want to get rid of it. And so I am doing, attempting to do a deal at the moment. Please keep it in prayer. But I have to deal with unsaved people. However, the person in Singapore who I am in partnership with in doing this, he's a saved Christian. He's a brother in Christ. Now, you have to deal with lawyers and accountants and investors. You have to deal with unsaved people. We're in the world, but we're not of it. But you cannot become legally or financially bound to non-believers. Do business with them? Well, you have to. You go to the dry cleaners to drop off your suits, and you pick them up, and you you, you, you start shirts. You've got to pay for your starch in your shirts, your, your, your laundry. You have to deal with unsaved people. Deal with them is one thing, but becoming legally or financially bound to them is something very, very different. Very different. God hates that mixture. He hates that mixture. When he sees a, someone who becomes a Christian who has a wife or a husband who isn't a Christian, no matter how desperate you are to see your unsaved husband or your unsaved wife get saved, remember, God wants to see them saved more than you do. <laughs> God wants to see them saved more than you do. Uh, you might love them. God loves them even more than you do. <laughs> Incredible. Praise the Lord for that. You cannot fathom the depths of his love. But neither can we fathom the depths of his righteousness. He hates this mixture. You're going to marry somebody, you're going to sleep with somebody, procreate kids with somebody. He wants to commit it Believers, do not marry an unsaved person. I would go so far as to say, if you're a new Christian and you've gotten engaged, postpone the wedding until they get saved and make sure they are saved. Now, in my personal life, I went through this. I'm being very personal here, not too personal, but I'll tell you the truth. Some of my friends know this. When I met my wife in Jerusalem, she was a Jewish atheist. I was taking an Arab guy to the hospital. See, I did well financially in New York, and I would go on short-term mission trips to Israel. I shouldn't say mission, but short-term evangelistic journeys to Israel, and I would go to biblical sites in the Middle East on my way there and back and things like this that I want to see the seven churches in Egypt and where Moses was and things like that. But uh, I used to go to Israel. And I was taking this Arab guy with gangrene to the hospital once, didn't speak much Hebrew at the time, and no Arabic. And I happened to meet this young lady who helped me translate, and she spoke good English, she spoke fluent Hebrew, and she spoke pretty good Arabic. Now, today I'm married to her. But her family were Holocaust survivors. And there was this whole big thing that went on. Is she becoming a Christian in order to marry this guy? We had to go through some very difficult times. Postponing, it, 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 it took a couple of years before it was clear to everybody, including the unsaved, that her faith and commitment to Yeshua does not depend on me. It was only about him. It had to be demonstrated. Her parents were Holocaust survivors. The idea of her believing in Jesus, there was people who claimed to have been Christians who murdered her family and things like this. Her grandparents and things like this went through the Holocaust. Grandfather was killed. Other family were killed and so forth. Well, that was Christians to her. That's what Christians did to Jews. 
not knowing the difference between a truly saved Christian and the, the Romanian Orthodox Church and things of that nature. Okay, we had to go through this. Uh, you know, they had to know that her faith was real, that she believed Yeshua, Jesus, was the Jewish Messiah, and it depended on him and on her relationship with him, not her relationship with me, even though I'm the one who told her the gospel and led her to Christ, to Yeshua. Well, that was quite a story. It was really quite a story. Uh, it had to be clear that our relationship was based on him and that her faith and my faith were only based on him. It, but it was difficult. The, the, the testing and trials we had to go through, it was, it was a, four years before we finally were able to get married. And I won't go through all of what happened, but it's a long story. If you are engaged to an unsaved person and you're a Christian, you need to stop that engagement until that unsaved person comes to faith and has been discipled and proves their faith. Uh, it's that serious. God hates the mixture. He hates a marriage that is not based on Christ. The husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. How can you marry an unsaved man? He can't be your head in the Lord, as Christ is the head of the church. You are fundamentally out of God's will. How can you let the mother of your children, future mother of your children, bring them up in the Lord if she's not in the Lord? You can't do it. God hates the mixture. He hates it in marriage. He hates it in business. He hates it in any way that we place ourselves in a bonded yoking with unsaved people. He hates it. It's something we just don't do. It's something that believers do not get involved in. At least we are not supposed to. God hates this mixture. Well, let's look at this further. The mixtures that God hates. Look with me, please, to Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 9. Deuteronomy 22, 9. You shall not sow your vineyard with two kinds of seed, lest all of the produce of the seed which you have sown and the increase of the vineyard become defiled. You shall not plow together with an ox and a donkey, nor wear material of mixed wool and linen together. An ox and a donkey. It's two oxen. Corinthians explains the idea of the oxen. Do not muzzle an ox when the ox is threshing. Those who thresh out the word of God teaches. Don't muzzle an ox when it's threshing. It teaches of the word. Paul explains this what it means. But don't listen to the ministry of an ox and then go listen to the ministry of a jackass. Don't listen to the ministry of a faithful teacher expositor of God's word. Don't listen to recordings of, 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 of uh, somebody who God blessed and God used to explain this and expound the scriptures faithfully. Uh, don't do that. Uh, but there are people who do. They'll listen to a good pastor, a good Bible study. They'll listen to a good teacher. They'll listen to somebody who teaches the truth. And then they will go listen to some ridiculous idiocy, some hype artistry. You know, there's been some wonderful preachers on the radio. 
Uh, Adrian Rogers is not with the Lord. He was a good preacher. I liked that guy. I really, really did. He, he was a good, he was a man of God, Adrian Rogers over in the United States. I'm using him as an example. For Americans, another one would be Martin Lloyd-Jones in Great Britain. These were faithful men of God. These were true oxes. They were <laughs> oxes. There's much increase from the strength of the ox. We have a teaching, uh, again, available on the Morio website on the strength of the ox. Well, you've got a Martin Lloyd-Jones. But the man who took his place at Westminster Chapel was not an ox. He was a jackass. I'm sorry, but R.T. Kendall got in bed with Paul Cain and the Kansas City Falls Prophets, and he promoted the Toronto deception. Stood in the pulpit of Martin Lloyd-Jones. What is wrong with Westminster Chapel in London? You don't yoke an ox with a donkey. There are people who will listen to, a, you know, an Adrian Rogers just say in America, they'll listen to somebody like him. And then they'll go listen to Joseph Prince or Benny Hinn or Paula White or something, or the Johnson, Bill Johnson or Michael Brown. They'll go listen to a donkey. No, 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 no. You need an ox, not a jackass. God hates the mixture. You can yoke two oxes together. You can get two faithful teachers giving right doctrine together. They may be different in style and emphasis. They may be different, but they're both oxes. But you don't mix them with donkeys. Well, the field, the wheat and the tares, keep the field pure. Now, this relates, of course, once again, to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, the so-called brethren. Look with me, please, to Proverbs 24, 21. Proverbs 24, 21. My son, fear the Lord, the king. Do not associate with those who are given to change. People who change traditional biblical doctrine. Keep away from them. Don't get involved with them. You don't exchange. It's an unequal match. You can't hold to the traditional path and to those who want to change direction. You can't do that. We are told that those who cause dissensions are the ones who take a different path. Dikostasia is the Greek word in Romans. They take a different path. You see these people today in the New Apostolic Reformation, they've taken a different path. Michael Brown blesses and promotes Bill Johnson. Let him go. He did the same with Pensacola. Let them take their different path. They cause dissension. We shouldn't be yoked with such people. We shouldn't mix with such people. You can't hold to scriptural doctrine and false doctrine simultaneously. You can't hold the scriptural doctrine, and fundamentally false doctrine. It doesn't work. False doctrine will always be abandoned. Where you, I'm sorry, true doctrine will always be abandoned where false doctrine is allowed to proliferate. You go to the field, there's going to be pears sown among the wheat. God does not want them growing together. He hates the mixture. But let us continue, please. Let's look a little further. 
Look with me to Numbers chapter 5, verse 15. God hates the mixture. Now we explain Numbers 5. The right of ordeal, the law of jealousy, it is available on our website. The right of ordeal, the law of jealousy. Um, Numbers chapter 5, verse 15. If a man shall bring his wife to the priest and bring as an offering for her one-tenth of an ephah of barley, he shall not pour oil on it or put frankincense on it. It is a grain offering of jealousy, a grain offering of memorial, a reminder of iniquity. Now, there are other times, as we read in Leviticus, where you do mix incense with the grain. There are other times when you do mix oil with the grain. The prayer of the saints, the anointing, there are times when you do. But this is the right of ordeal, the law of jealousy. A husband who was jealous of, an, of, of infidelity by his wife. When you're confronting error, when you're confronting error scripturally, Forget about the incense and forget about the oil. The incense that should be a soothing aroma, sweet to, to use an anthropomorphism, sweet to the nostrils of the Lord, becomes a smokescreen. God doesn't want incense in that case. You can't have prayer with people when there's sin and error. You can't have fellowship and, and joint worship with people like that. You can't smooth it over with a false anointing. False prophets are not anointed. If they are, they're anointed in hell. You see these people. They try to avoid dealing with what the scripture says as a hard reality by super pa packaging it in oil and incense. The preaching at Hillsong, the, the Carl Lynn stuff, was a perfect example of this. When he was asked about homosexuality in an interview, he wouldn't deal with what the Word of God said. Instead, it was just a lot of oil and incense but there was no substance. When you're dealing with apostasy, when you're dealing with unrepentant immorality, you deal with the grain alone, the hardcore teaching of Scripture. Thou shalt not commit adultery. You shall not lay with a man as if a woman. You can't do that. Oh, but we're having such great worship and the Lord is moving it. No, 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 no. Look what you wind up with. Look what's happening to Hillsong and to Lynn's. And, and as he's not the first one and he won't be the last. You don't mix incense and oil with the grain when you're dealing with heresy and serious sin. You just don't do that. But let's continue. God hates that kind of a mixture. Look with me also, please, once again, to you shall not mix the seeds of the animals. The word there in Hebrew is zara, but the Greek word is sperma. Sperma. For 25 years, maybe longer, but certainly 25 years. I, and I'm not saying I'm the only one by any means, but I speak for myself. For 25 years, I've been warning believers that... Biogenetic engineering in the hands of fallen man is going to result in something demonic.
Last week, it was announced at a laboratory in La Jolla, California. La Jolla is just north of, of San Diego. That a project funded by China at an American genetics lab was putting human, human DNA into monkeys. They were splicing human DNA into monkeys. Now, do you realize what's going to happen as they continue down this path? Okay, they destroyed the embryos, but eventually they're going to create humanoids. Animal rights is going to become equated with human rights. It already is in the minds of some of the greenies and the animal rights activists, but it's going to become a tangible issue when you continue this gene splicing. Recombinant DNA does not cross the genus barrier in the natural environment, <clears throat> except where you have a bacteriophage, and then it works to the destruction of the host cell. There are rats who've been given 1% human DNA. What would happen if a rat had high intelligence? approximating human. These monsters in the book of Revelation are plainly symbolic of demonic beings. I don't question that. Christians have always known that they're symbolic. But we're reaching a point that we can no longer say they are purely symbolic. They may be genetically engineered humanoids. Now, this relates to other subjects like the Nephilim and so forth. And, of course, conspiracy theorists have made a circus out of that issue. But the scriptures do speak of just as it was in the days of Noah. And we see this coming together with extraterrestrial phenomena and UFOs. And many of the claimed abductees speak of these aliens as having an interest in their reproductive organs and so forth. Not our subject tonight, I'd point you to the teaching that we've always done, just as in the days of Noah. But the things I was saying 25 years ago are becoming a reality now. They are becoming a reality now. And there were others who said it, not just me, but I said it 25 years ago. But others have said it independent of me. I've said it independent of them, but it's becoming and it's coming. This mixing of the seed. Anything that can be used for good. Anything that can be used for good. Well, suppose we use DNA to increase the intelligence of Jack Russell dogs to kill rats. And the Jack Russells are naturally good rat killers, but if we make them smarter, they'll be better rat killers, and we can fight the plague of rats in Chicago. These things always begin with some kind of good intention. They'll always begin with some kind of good intention. Organ transplantation or something like this to make uh, animal tissue implantable into humans to save human lives. Th these things will begin with noble intention. <clears throat> but once as we, again, as we always say, anything fallen man can use for evil Fallen man ultimately will use for evil. If Christ is not in control of a society, its intellectual power, including its scientific wherewithal, will be in the power of the wicked one. Look with me, please, if you will, to Exodus chapter 30, verse 33. Whoever shall mix any like it or puts any of it on a layman shall be cut off from his people. What is this talking about? It is talking 
about the anointing, the anointing. You can't mix it for someone else. It is holy unto the person to whom God has given it. We've explained this. But also concerning the incense in verse 34 through verse 38. This incense must be made in the proportions God has ordained exactly. If you mix it with other things, it's an abomination. And today we have mixed incense. Not an equal portion of each, a wrong portion of each. What you have is entertainment. And people getting doctrine from singing choruses like a mantra that are not even scriptural. Spiritual seduction. Same thing in Hinduism. Now it's come to the Western church. They sing the same choruses over and over and over, and they think it's worship. No, it's not. It's spiritual indoctrination. It's a mixture. You look at Hillsong. Well, it seems to be Christian. Yeah, but I mean, it seems to be a rock concert or something. I'm not talking about the music, but the lyrics and the hype and the false anointing. God hates that kind of a mixture. The Father wants to be worshipped in spirit and in truth. Not a mixture. Not a mixture. Well, let's look at another case. Turn with me, please, if you will, to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel 2. We have a conference going on here in England at the present moment, and this conference is taking place in Cornwall, England, with the G7 and the Global Reset people and the EU and Biden. And what are they doing? What are they trying to do concerning the global economy? And what are they particularly trying to do with respect to Europe, the EU? Well, verse 43. And what you saw, the iron mixed with common clay, they will combine with one another in the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, even as iron does not combine with pottery. Notice the seed of men. and the iron and the clay. These nations do not adhere to one another. They're too different historically, culturally, linguistically. They're very different than each other. The things that held these nations together, like Roman Catholicism or Protestantism, Europe is post-Christian, Neo-pagan. Those things are not glues anymore. In the aftermath of the Reformation, the Pope could stop Catholic countries from fighting each other or tell Catholic countries to fight Protestant countries and force Catholic countries to fight Protestant countries, or you'll have a papal anathema. You'll go to hell if you don't attack the Protestant. This went on. The Pope was able to keep peace in South America in the period of the South American conquistadors who subjugated the Indians of Latin America when there was conflict between Spain and Portugal. 
because they were both Catholic, he could do it. He claimed the inheritance of Constantine. These religious glues are coming apart in most places. Residual elements of it exist in Northern Ireland, but it's coming, it's come apart. Iron does not stick to clay. Strong countries with strong economies uh, will never have weak countries with weak economies as co-equal partners. The, as I've said before, and this is not political, the Euro Bank, the Central Bank of, of the EU, the Euro Bank is simply the German Bundesbank with a new name. The Euro is simply the Deutschmark with a new name. Greece got rid of the drachma and took the Euro. Ireland got rid of the punt and took the Euro. You know, Fran you know. <laughs> what that basically did was made the iron iron predominate and the clay had to try to stick to something that was hurting it now you 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 can't devalue the drachma or the italian lira against the euro anymore because you only have the euro you don't have drachma or lira this is very much work to the benefit of the wealthier countries in europe particularly germany I'm not being anti-German. I'm just explaining what happened. Iron does not stick to clay. God hates that kind of a mixture. We were told in the book of Joshua, Joshua was commanded, don't mix with those nations. Don't do it, said Joshua. He was told not to do it. Hosea chapter 7, the same thing. This attempt to forcibly mix nations. Now, we're not talking about nations in the political sense or the economic sense. We're talking about nations in the ethnic sense, the seed of men. They are trying to force people into euro federalism but that's only one step the globalists want to force us all into a reset global environment that will be political economic and sociological it's unbelievable it's unbelievable making laws that control all people. Well, who are those laws going to most benefit? The wealthy and the powerful. Now, this again has to do with the prophecies of Daniel and the countries in the Roman Empire coming back together. This is a big story. It involves a lot of things and there are multiple aspects to it. But the iron and the clay do not mix. Yet they're trying to make it mix. They are mixing the seed. They are mixing the worship. They are mixing the flax, that is the linen, and the wool. God, however, hates the mixture. There's the new wine, the pure wine. Look with me, please, if you will, to Proverbs chapter 9, verse 5. The harlot, the seductress, trying to seduce. We read in verse 2, first of all, she's prepared her food and she has mixed her wine. Come eat my food, in verse 5, and drink the wine I have mixed. It's not Shiraz or Cabernet Sauvignon. It's not Cote d'Iron. It's not Chateau Neuf du Pape. It's not any of that. It's not a pure grape. It's not the Shiraz. Or it is not... Uh, 
anything of that nature. It's, it's, it's not. It's mixed with other stuff. It's mixed with other stuff. We're not talking about Beaujolais, or we're not talking, you know, about some vintage. We're talking not about Shiraz or Merlot. We're talking about something that's mixed. Well, look with me, please, at the crucifixion of Jesus. Mark 15, verse And they tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, but he didn't take it. He didn't take it. No. They also tried to give him gall. <laughs> they tried to give him a mixed wine that was flavored with myrrh. Myrrh. He wouldn't do it. Remember, his body was going to be anointed with myrrh. He received myrrh from the Magi as a baby. With the wine? That was different. Had the wine not been mixed with myrrh, he might have drank it. Had it been pure wine, he might have drank it. But he wouldn't drink the mixed. Today we have the new wine, the pure wine, Holy Spirit. But in Toronto, Canada, and Pensacola, Florida, and in Bethel, California, they drink a mixed wine. They say things are of the Holy Spirit but they introduce toxins that create delirium, that create uh, a kind of inebriation that seduces and misleads people. They think they're drinking the wine of the new covenants. They think they're drinking the wine that commemorates the blood of Christ from the com communion. Or they think it's the new wine. No. There's something mixed with that wine. Don't drink it. You keep away from the new apostolic reformation. You keep away from Hillsong. You keep away from the ecumenical movements. You don't drink mixed wine. We want the pure wine. God hates the mixture. He hates the mixture. A marriage with an unsaved person? A contracted business partnership with a non-believer? Take your pick. God doesn't like it. Mixing the seed of men. God doesn't like it. Iron and clay. God doesn't like it. Law and grace. God doesn't like it. Linen is linen, and wool is wool. 
God hates the mixture. Thank you so much for listening.